Good morning, Hope Church. I do it again. Good morning, Hope Church. Praise God. Now, we know this is a very special Sunday. It's been announced it's a mission Sunday. So I just want you to open quickly with a quick scripture. And this comes from Romans. We have been studying Romans. And I want you to be encouraged this morning. When Paul says that first he thanks, I, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit is preaching the gospel of his son. He is my witness. And he also said, I remember you in my prayers at all times. I pray that you now, that you now, that you now at last, by God's will, uh, may be, uh, will, will the way may be opened for me to come to you. And then he says, I long to see you so that I might impart to, uh, to you some spiritual gift and make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This morning, we're going to talk about missions and that takes a lot of faith. This morning we're going to talk about what people are doing around the world to impart others with what God is doing. And so what's also happening here, we could say that Paul is telling us that he's encouraged. Let's encourage each other mutually by spreading the word of God, by just telling one another, but mainly outside these doors. And I believe as we go to the, the service this morning, we will be encouraged to share, not only to keep it to ourselves, this wonderful message of salvation, but we owe it to the world. So let's pray and let's start tonight, this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this morning, Lord. I pray, God, that, Father, you will, Father, be with us this morning, Lord, as we celebrate what you have been doing amongst people, Father, and we also, Father, pray, Lord, that you will encourage us this morning. God, Father, that you will help us this morning. Lord, you understand the message, Lord, the greatest commission that you've given, Lord, that we should go. So I pray, God, where you will fill the ones speaking, the, the ones leading, the ones, Father, taking care of this morning, Lord, that we will be mutually encouraged. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord. Be with us this morning. Be our guest. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand up?
Every soul. 
What would you dare to do for Jesus? Would you defy dictators? Worship in secret? Sacrifice your safety? Over 360 million Christians around the world face persecution and discrimination every day. Despite the danger, in all these countries, the church is not defeated. It is living, powerful, defiant. And for over 65 years, Open Doors has stood with this church. Where Christians risk persecution, our underground networks support millions of believers with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggled Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. And where Christians enjoy freedom, we work with local churches to raise prayer and support and to speak truth to those in power. Every day around the world, Christians risk everything to follow Christ. Will you dare to stand with them? So open doors. 
Doors is one of those ministries that we've given to, and their primary role is to help the persecuted Christians. As you said, saw in the video, over 360 million Christians across this world are persecuted. And we're going to take a moment here just in a little bit. We're going to pray for them. We're not going to pray over every one of the uh, missions that we're going to be sharing today, but I just felt led that let's pray for these persecuted Christians in a minute. Um, as you saw in the video, they educate, um, they mobilize the body of Christ um, to those that are per persecuted. They have work with local churches such as ourselves to help raise support, um, that help provide Bibles, Christian materials. They do training for pastors who are going underground and to minister to these persecuted Christians. And you know our prayer when we pray it honestly is strength for these people because the, I'm not saying their particular life is going to get any better, but the world itself, persecuting Christians, is not going to get any better. What we can pray for is strength and for Jesus to come and to minister to yes. them because they are risking everything, yes. everything for Christ. Mm -hmm. We can't really comprehend that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes... We might have a conversation that has friction with someone about Christ, but do we risk our lives? Maybe sometimes we've been encountered or we know someone maybe that has, but I, I personally, I don't know about you, but I can't speak for you, but I personally cannot even comprehend some of the things that these Christians face. The risk to just say Jesus, to say that they're a Christian, to believe in, in our Lord and Savior is, is everything for them. So if you don't mind, before we share another mission that you've been a part of, I hope, I hope you know, uh, Hope Church, that this is something that we can just smile about and be proud about and say we are helping the persecuted Christians across this world. So if you don't mind, let's stand up. Let's pray for these over 360 million Christians. Let's just take a moment. Dear Heavenly Father God, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord God. Lord, we may not comprehend or understand the things that they're going, Lord. God, we just pray your Holy Spirit come into them, Lord. Give them strength. Give them peace. Oh, Lord, you are the great I am. Lord, they can endure more than they can even imagine because you are with them, oh, Father God. Lord, their lives are being laid down for your sake, oh God, Lord, to that others would know who you are, Lord. God, it's not in vain. Our yes. labor's not in vain. Our lives are not in vain, Lord. Yes. You will use it for your kingdom to further it, Lord God. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you, God, have called these people, Lord, to such a hardship that we can't even imagine, oh Father God, that they would lay down, oh Father God. So we just pray, oh Father, Lord, move, use them, oh Father God, to reach, Lord, the many more that, that are needed, Father God, for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I want to share uh, another ministry that we've had the opportunity to give to before, and this is um, a summer camp. It's called Sky, Sky Summer Camp, and I will show a video. It won't have um, sound. Um, you can go ahead and show it. So this summer camp is actually in Pennsylvania, and it's uh, connected with the uh, Summit International uh, Bible School. And they help uh, provide, actually, a summer camp for kids who may not can afford to go to summer camp. And they just bless the socks off of them, as we would say. I don't know if y'all say that here. But <laughs> they bless the socks off of them for this week of camp. And they just instill in them, they grow their skills, they grow their talents, and they just pour God's love into them. They teach about God, and they come out. One testimony from one little boy was, this is the best week I've ever had, full of fun and full of God. And how much more could they need, right? And uh, I just want to say thank you, Hope Church, uh, for giving um, because you've gone, you've supported a few kids to be able to go to this camp in the summer. And uh, so we wanted to let you know one of the things that you've done. I'm going to uh, hand it over to Lisa now. Um, as you know, she spent much of last year in Africa with working with an organization called AIM, A-I-M, and it stands for Africa Inland Missions. And uh, she worked in two different countries, 
and she's going to share all about it. We've been waiting to hear and to see what what she did and all that she, that God used her for. And so, welcome, Ms. Bell. <laughs> So I have a short video, so I have a time limit on this. Um, if not, I could share a hundred, hundred million stories about what has happened and what God did while I was there. But I'm going to show you quickly a short video. It has sound, so.
So I actually have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share, but God really moved in my heart when I was out there. We are all called and chosen for a purpose. And sometimes we're called across oceans. And sometimes we're called to right where we are. So God really moved in my heart and my life. And even coming up to going to Africa, God opened the doors and closed doors. I had a plan for my life. I had plans to go and do worship and go and seek God for something that I thought was the right way. And God closed the door and I was so disappointed. And he opened the door to go to Africa. And he changed my heart. He won my heart for his calling, for his mission, and he's just planted the seed, and he's been so incredibly good. And I was so honored and blessed to be able to spend time in Kenya and South Sudan, and I'm so honored and blessed that you guys supported me in it, that you guys um, helped me get there, that you guys supported God's call, and um, that um, you guys were just amazing, church. You guys didn't go physically, but you went spiritually on your knees in prayer and providing for me and supporting me for me, giving giving donations so that I could make a way to go there. So I'm going to share a little bit about what I did in Kenya. So the video showed a lot of, of what I did. Um, so I spent my time on the Hurry Hills in northern Kenya with a, tri a tribe called the Gabra people. Um, they're in the far north, you can see there's like a little white dot in the middle of the north. Um, that's a mars of it. It's extremely dangerous there. Um, we went through there and we had to pay, we had to try and pay bribes to go through because there would be so many roadblocks. Every small little settlement or village, the police would be watching because there was so much unrest in the region. And many people died while I was there because they are tribal conflicts and everything. But um, I worked just a little bit north, um, northwest of Marsabit, and I worked with a Brazilian couple actually called the Da Silva family. Their name is Edgy and Angie Da Silva, but people call them Jado and Jada, uh, Jaba and Jado, and Jaba means father or big man, and Jado means the one we're waiting for. And their testimony of how they were brought there was even, is even more amazing. Uh, before I even came there, the whole Region was in drought for two years. They're now currently in the drought. They haven't had rain since last April. And yeah, two years since they had since they didn't have any rain. And just before I arrived, um, a week before I arrived, my missionary leaders were in Nairobi and they went up north and they traveled up north. But just before they arrived, the only place in the whole entire region, like I think it's like, I don't know, like a hundred kilometer radius at least, um, only rain fell on our compound and provided for me to go there because if I had arrived and we didn't have rain, we wouldn't have water, so we wouldn't be able to cook, clean, or do anything. But when I arrived, um, the week before I arrived, they had rain only on the circular area of our compound and every barrel was filled. So God provided. <laughs> he provided. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I did in. Um, Kenya, we did a women's project um, linked with an organization in Brazil called Hafura, which means breathe, and it's focused mainly on women. The women's ministry is so important because the women in the community, in the Gabra community, are the bottom. It goes men, children, animals, women. Women are treated like the lowest of the low, they're treated like dirt, and we, the, the projects, what we were working on, were focused on getting the women to be able to make something, getting a craft so they can start selling amongst themselves and outside further away. So my missionary leader should go and sell what they made in Brazil and in Nairobi and anywhere else. She has like a, she sends out a whole list of the items they make and they go out every time you subscribe to their newsletter or something. So the women were able to make things themselves and were able to um, raise funds for themselves so their husbands couldn't take everything off them or couldn't um, fight them for it because they made it themselves and they would be able to even hide the money that they would make so their husbands wouldn't steal it to go buy alcohol or even there's one sort of local drug that they have so men couldn't even buy their own drugs or alcohol. 
and many of the women, the testimonies of these women is unbelievable. There is one, there's two ladies in the jewelry group that we had that left their husbands because their husbands wanted another wife. And they, they became Christians and they knew that God said you could only have one wife. No one told them, no Bible, they couldn't read. But they knew the Holy Spirit showed them and revealed to them that that wasn't right. That's not right. You're not supposed to have more than one, more than one wife. And um, they knew that and they separated from their husbands. Their husbands still provided for them, but they separated from their husbands. And the stories and the and the heartbreak and the abuse that the women go through to hear the stories that they're still with God and their God is their hope and He's their He's their rock. He's their redeemer. He's their their everything. It's just unbelievable. It's just unmatched. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So this one lady, her name is Mama Bonet, and she, um, she was a real inspiration. She's one of the women that said no to her husband when he wanted to get remarried, and she was um, really um, a pillar of faith in the community. And her son, um, his name is Julio, Julio, and he. Um, and he would always come after Sunday school and church. He would take his little coloring page and go to every little house in the community and collect all the children. And he would do another Sunday school story because he lived like a couple of kilometers away from where we had church. So he would come to church, get his coloring page, and go out to the communities and share what he learned in church to the communities. And that's sort of what we can do here now in our own lives. We can take what we hear from God and take what we learn from God in church and we can go and share it to others. And we can also take what we learn from God in our own quiet, personal devotions and share it to others. And it was just an inspiration to be able to learn from this child. So we're going to go to the next slide. So, yeah, when I was there towards the end of my stay in Northern, Northern Kenya, we had the first ever women's gathering. Um, so the women are the bottom of society there. They're the lowest of the low. And we decided, to, as a church, to create a day where we were just going to honor women and we were going to put women, um, we are going to serve the women and there was a handful of men from the church, there's really few men, but it took a lot of convincing and a lot of town meetings to get them on board, but in the end the men decided that they were going to serve the women, so they made chai for the women in the morning and lunch for them in the evening and um, the women would, the facial expressions they would have when the men went to serve them. They didn't know, like all the teenagers and young girls would giggle and run away. And the women, like loads of the older women would just sit there like in shock, in absolute awe. Because many of them had never ever been served. They would, they, would make the, they would make the tea every morning. They would make the food. The men would never touch any of that unless they seriously had to. So it was just amazing to see. And over half of the women, we had 50 women that day. So 25, about 25 of the women that were there were pagan god worshippers. They worshipped a god called Hayana, who was really extremely occult. They would make sacrifices to this god. They would paint blood all over themselves once a month um, because they wanted blessing from this god Hayana. And ha over half of the women that showed up were, um, were pagan god worshippers. And many of them came to the faith, came to faith. And many of them prayed that day. They worshipped the day. They didn't know how to pray. My team leader had to go around to every group and show them how to pray because many of them had an idea that God was personal, that he was a God who cared and a God who loved. And it was just unbelievable. And I'm going to the next slide. So the men, this is just a picture of the men cooking. And as a gift for saying thank you to the men, we have a, we made a cup, which is this typical um, Kenyan chai cup. And we said galatom, which means thank you. So we made that for the men, and we can go to the next slide. And yeah, while the women were in their meeting, they were learning about the story of Ruth. Um, I was doing Bible, I was doing kids camp, whilst the, the women wouldn't be disturbed by their children. And I was able to tell them Bible stories and able to play games with them. And, and all the children decided that they were going to sing songs for <laughs> the, their, their mothers. So you can see that in the bottom corner. So we'll go to the next slide. And yeah, after that day, we had um, we have a small little Land Rover. It's really small, and we managed to pack 27 people. You see in the video, 27 people into it because after that day, every time we had three different church locations, and on the way to one church location, everyone wanted to come, and we had, we ended up packing 27 people. We had to pack all the men had to go on top, and the women and children inside. And one of the women, her name is Mama Bukayo, 
and she was in the middle of making her house and she decided, because they moved their house in, like every month they moved their house to a new location, and she was in the middle of rebuilding her house and she dropped what she was doing and said, no, I'm going to church. It's God's time. My God is more important than my house. And in that culture, when you move your house, you don't do anything. You don't go get locked by water. You're not supposed to cook. You're not supposed to do anything but build your house. So the fact that she dropped what she was doing to seek God, to go to church, to know that this time God is more important than what I have, what the clothes on my back, the roof over my head, God is more important. It was a huge thing for the community to see. For the community to see and it was a huge step um, of faith and just um, change in their lives. So, yeah. So we're going to go on to the next slide. And then, yeah, since there was drought, we got donations to do a water delivery. Go to the next slide. Perfect. So I went to the Lorraine tribe in South Sudan. So this was a lot more rural than the Gamber tribe. So we're actually, where I was, was just here, like right there. Um, it's a really rural tribe. They're very peaceful. Um, there is one main church there um, in a small place called Kimitong, in like a community called Kimitong. And I worked with a team leader, a team leader, Jacob, and my teammate, well, he met last <laughs> about a month ago. So we'll go to the next slide. So most of my first few months in besides Sudan were language learning. So as you saw that I a lot of community outreach involved getting dove in, diving into culture. And in my third week in in Lorem, I ended up doing a home space, so I lived in a hut for a week, seeing how they lived and learning language off of them, and it's a really humbling experience to have to learn language when you don't have a word, and they don't have a word of English, and you don't have a word of their language, and you're just trying to understand something. Um, but most of our weeks were spent language learning, and the biggest relationships I had with people was because I asked them to help me with language, and they decided to help, and then I formed unbreakable bonds with them. <coughs> so yeah, um, there we had church in every Sunday and we had lots of children because a lot of the parents would go to the gardens and work hard. A lot of the children would just run around um, naked, <laughs> literally naked, um, around the community and they would often come to church and every time they heard singing they were very eager to take part and they were always very eager to play. I made my best relationships with children. Um, there's one girl at the very end and I'll tell you a little bit of her story and then I'll finish up so let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, I hired a local woman to try and teach me the language and she ended up coming to church and really she learned, she started to learn how to read so she um, I gave her one of my old Bibles, and she has a Bible now, and she is really excited to learn the language. Um, it was really difficult there with requests, because people had so little, um, they often ask for things, and previous people that come were um, mostly like um, NGOs, non-government organizations, that would just give out t-shirts, give out food, give out everything for free, and most of them were not African, they were white people, so anytime they seen a white person, they expected you to take your clothes off your back and give it to them, or your shoes off your feet and give it to them. And it was a really big learning curve for a lot of them to see that we're, we have more to give than what we have, like our clothes, our physical, we have a more sus, um, substantial thing that we can give to them. And then we, as you've seen in the video, we, had, we often watched the Jesus film that was dubbed over in the local language, there's five local guys who now live in the capital city and work on translating the Bible and work on translate, like work, did the translation mostly for this film. So I'll go to the next slide. And yeah, we took every opportunity to practice language. At the top corner, I learned how to read within three months of being there and I was able to read Bible stories to all the kids. So I got, um, we, had a little, we had a couple of Bibles that were like in the beginning stages of being translated. So I was able to take Bible stories from that and teach the children. So we go to the next slide. See, so this is just a local dance. They love their beads and on buoyancy and feathers and everything. They, it was very, very interesting. <laughs> so yeah, we had a Saturday morning Bible study. So on Saturday mornings, you'd be up at five o'clock in the morning, and you'd go to yeah, we we go to do Bible study in one area, and then we travel um, right beside our compound to a witch doctor. She's not a witch doctor anymore, but she was, and we do Bible study in her compound, and I'll just share one last story on the next slide. So there's one girl here, and her name's Nuoi, and if anything I can tell you about her, she was the biggest, the hardest, toughest cookie there was when I arrived. They, they get tin cans, and 
they beat each other up for a tin can. They call them vocals. And um, I remember once the first time I ever had a Bible, a Bible, kids Bible reading or studying or whatever. Fun time on my compound. Afterwards, I seen her beating up a kid for her tin can, and she threw the tin can over the fence into our compound. And I was like, no, no. I picked it up. I went to her and said, God says we have to give. If we want something, we're better to give than to take. And we have to love everyone else around us. And we have to give. We, we're not called to take off people and beat people up. We have to love everyone. And then a couple weeks later, I was out climbing trees, picking berries with her. <laughs> and, and one of the other kids grabbed berries off another child, the younger child. And she said, she got so angry, she went to that kid and said, no, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to take, we're supposed to give, we're supposed to love. That's not love, that's not love. And she got really angry at the kid. But if that's one thing, you can see the change in her. And even afterwards, through my last day there, this girl here, and the chick, this tall one, she, um, wanted to give me a spiky cucumber, it's like a cucumber with lots of spikes, and she wanted to give it to me, and then she changed her mind, and then she walks over, and Noah walks over, and is like, no, we're supposed to give, and not supposed to take, and then she hands me one of her spiky cucumbers, which is so, so sweet, and afterwards, you could just see the change in, the, in, change in her, and she was constantly making sure that she was giving rather than taking it. That was one thing that made a difference in my time there. It was worth it. If that's one lesson I could teach and one thing I could impart to them, it was worth it. And I think we can all learn something about that. It's better to give than to take, like missions in general. Thank you. I know. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to go on a missions trip. Um, some are shorter or longer than others. Hers was about nine months. And there's a saying we say in America um, when you're going to, for a missions trip is maybe give a year and pray about a lifetime. Because you're going to do so much and to bless and to give and give and give and give. And you can hear it out of Lisa's heart, how much she received, she received, she received, how much she's been blessed by it. So I know um, our youth are, are, are going on a missions trip this summer, but maybe down the future we can have something that Hope Church can be a part of or go to. Because if you've never gone on a missions trip, even if it's a week or something like that, it's something about giving like you've never given before. Um, I want to share a few more things, a few more areas that you've been able to be a blessing to. The first one is called Wellspring of Life. It's actually here in Ireland. And uh, this uh, ministry hosts 10 families. Um, it's a charity that really provides a safe and peaceful atmosphere for uh, women to take refuge in, women and their family, their kids. Um, who are really dealing with um, heavy domestic abuse. And uh, so this uh, agency takes in about 10 families at a time and they uh, work with them for their accommodation, their food, they help take them to uh, meetings that they may have with solicitors or court cases or things like that and they give them counseling. They give them uh, training and courses that they may need. They provide for their babies and their kids. And uh, again, Hope Church, you can go away thinking, wow, I've helped give mm -hmm. to these families, these women, these children, and the hardship that they're facing. And, the, and this is a godly ministry that they're involved in, that they get the word of God, not only physical things that are that they need, but they're also getting something of life into their souls that helps them through the process of healing. And so, thank you, Hope Church. Um, this next one, I have a video I'm going to show that does have sound. Just heard that uh, Hurricane Ian has met, now made landfall uh, as a very high Category 4, nearly a Category 5 soar. Don't know what this is going to look like, but it uh, sounds like it could be bad. Just got off the phone with a pastor and got an update. Pine Island is a total loss. They said that the only two houses standing is their house and the neighbor's house. We're starting to get close. As we 
we've talked to different people on the ground. Everybody is scared and overwhelmed. So get ready to just love on people. Please understand what we're doing here. We're here to bring essential supplies, but more than that, we're here to bring hope. So this one is called Convoy of Hope, and we've actually had the opportunity to bless Convoy of Hope twice. One time it was uh, giving funds to America for the very hurricane uh, relief that you saw on the video, and another one was here in Europe to uh, help. They have Convoy of Hope uh, works with uh, over 127 countries, and they provide aid through disasters, refugee crises, wars. Um, to date, they've served over 582 million meals, and they've been a response to over 550 disasters. And one thing that I think is pretty incredible about Convoy of Hope is, uh, you know, there's uh, 1.8 million nonprofit organizations, and Convoy of Hope is served in the top 50 year after year after year. And they're just making an impact. They're, they're there. You saw all the trucks. It touches my heart when people are in desperate need. They've lost everything. And here comes truck after truck after truck filled with supplies and to be there uh, with the love of Jesus. And Hope Church, you've given to that. You've given to that twice. And that's just incredible. I want to say thank you. Um, one last one I just want to share here. The most recent one of the most recent ones that you've um, probably, you were a part of. In November, we had a fundraiser for our youth. Um, they're going to Budapest uh, this summer, and our young adults, and we had a fundraiser. Many of you came to that fundraiser uh, where they served, and uh, you also gave a part uh, in helping them. They're going to be doing some other fundraisers in the next coming months. But you've already invested in them and doing so much for them to go on this. The some of them very first time to ever go on a missions trip like this. They're going in Budapest to help do a kids camp. And um, they're also going to be helping out an outreach center. So, um, and, and doing worship for uh, Hungarian, no, not Hungarian church, but they're doing worship for an international church. Um, I want to introduce some other guests that we have here today. Uh, their names are Yap and Aziza DeCook. They're actually in, in brother of uh, Evelyn, and they work with a, an organization called ANN. You're going to hear all these uh, acronyms. <laughs> is uh, Advancing Native Missions, and we've actually um, given to African and Native Missions before, but I'm going to uh, invite them up here to share what their ministry does, and then how we get a part of that. Mm -hmm. okay. we'll, uh, we'll have a video with some. <laughs> that seems to be important. So. <laughs> So, um, 
um, like Andrew said, we are Yap and Aziza, and uh, indeed we're related uh, with uh, Ismail and Evelyn. Um, um, it's such a privilege to be here this morning and uh, to share. Um, I was just thinking about like that next um, month we will be in Letterkenny, counting on about 26 years. So we've actually lived longer in Ireland than we have lived in the Netherlands. We're originally from the Netherlands and um, God called us so 26 years ago to help the church in Letterkenny and uh, yeah, help uh, there to um, whatever our hand find, uh, find to do. We have five children of which one is uh, Matthew and his lovely wife Amy. So uh, it's uh, so nice to be here and spend time with them also. Um, three years ago, God brought a different um, ministry into our life, which is A and M, Advancing Native Missions. So we work as field directors over Europe, and uh, the aim of A and M is to find the natives. This is all in the name to find the natives who already do the work of a missionary. And um, the heart of A&M is to reach unreached people groups. Yeah, so there is, uh, well, our, our motto is, you know, it's Matthew 24, 14, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear hear it, and then the end will come. So it's a little bit different than uh, Open Doors. Uh, we, we, we specifically go into areas where the gospel is not being preached, has never been preached, and where the natives are. So uh, you probably know that we are on a very heavy ball here. We have about 8 billion people in the world at this stage, <clears throat> close to it anyway. About 3 billion have never heard the gospel. 2 billion have no idea uh, at all about Jesus Christ. So. Uh, how are we going to reach these people? That's going to be a big task, even if all of us went out together. It would be a tough task. But So a and m as Aziza says, it's finding... So, a little... just If we, we went away as missionaries to another country, and it took a time to learn the culture, the language was okay, but... Oh yeah, that's for Aziza, she can all that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we find, what we want to find is the indigenous people. So. Um, Aziza and myself, we are in Europe. You might think Europe is okay. Now there's a lot of people who have never heard the gospel. So we'll go uh, through others. We'll find through other good Christians that know about these people. There's somebody in these hills. It's a local. Knows the language. Knows the culture. Knows uh, the political atmosphere. Go and check them out. Find them and use them. So I love them. Yeah, they already have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to forgive, but... <laughs> I just get very excited about this stuff, you know? Yeah, but indeed, like Yav said, um, um, so why indigenous missionaries, why is it so important to a and It is because they know the language, they know the culture, they understand the religious and the political atmosphere. They are used even to the physical climate. They live at the same financial level as the rest of the people around them, most of them anyway. And they know how to make finances stretch in their own culture. So you give them a little, but they know how to stretch it to and use it for uh, far more than we could. So we have partners who are in uh, Bulgaria, and they are all the way on the east southeast side of Bulgaria. It's in the Rodopi Mountains. And Islam is the predominant religion over there. And, uh, so you see a lot of mosques, you hear the call to prayer five times a day. And, um, and uh, this couple, Harry and Penka is their names, they uh, go out and they into the mountain villages and they share the love of Jesus Christ. They do that through children's camps. They have uh, the shoe boxes, which is a big um, um, uh, tool that they use in that area. And they also, especially through COVID, they use uh, food. So they brought food parcels, and especially to the elderly people. 
In the Rodopi Mountains, at the moment, um, there is not a lot of young people. So there's a lot of elderly people that don't have anybody that looks after them. So that is what they do. And they share, in a practical sense, they share the love of Jesus Christ. There was a lady there, a Muslim, uh, with a Muslim background, um, who became, together with her husband, they became uh, Christians. And we were sitting there one day and listening to her testimony. And I mean, seriously, our hearts were so touched by it. And uh, they were persecuted um, by the, their family, by their friends. They could not buy food in the shops in their little village. They had to go out and buy food somewhere else because nobody wanted to sell them food because they betrayed Islam. But what happened was, um, well, not what happened, what we, we asked her at some stage, we said to her, what about on a Friday when it's the holy day of Islam, why don't you go out and uh, go to another village, go to the bigger village and get a little bit of a rest? And she just looked at us like, huh? And then she said, but no, she said, I cannot go on Friday. On Friday, we pray. We pray for our family, we pray for our people. We need to be here on Friday because Friday is the most important day that we need to pray for our family and for our friends and the community around us. And um, I must say for me, that was just such a, um, even a challenge, like what do I do? What do I give? And of course, in a way we all give, but what can I sacrifice for his kingdom so that his kingdom can move forward? Do you know that in Europe, out of the 27 countries, there is at least nine countries who are atheists in Europe? In Sarajevo, the capital city of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is in the Balkan, that Sarajevo has 99% of Muslims. That Bosnia and Herzegovina is the least evangelized in the whole of Europe. And it's only around the corner from us. It's not that far. And people have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of Eastern Europe has been under communism for a long time. And then now Islam wants to come out of Turkey and uh, take over many of the countries again, like it did many years ago with the Ottoman Empire. But, of course, God is at work. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, so we have seen uh, personally already uh, people, the local missionaries, the native missionaries at work, we've seen, seen a man in, in, in uh, well, let's see where we are. Montenegro, working in the Roma community, uh, reaching, it's, it's not a place where people want to go, but it's the locals reaching the locals, and just being in that community, you're like, we would never, they, they wouldn't accept us, but they accept him, you know? And so we've seen that, and they're just going on, you've seen Macedonia, uh, how, how uh, Macedonia is one of the least reached. You know, remember in the Bible it talks about Macedonia, Paul going? Well, it's one of the least reached. The gospel is it's, it's le less than 1% of the Christians. I think it's 0.2% Christians, evangelical believers. In Bosnia, it's 0.07%. Mm. It's less than zero. <laughs> uh, no, anyway. But anyway. <laughs> it's minus. It's minus. Anyway. Um, so, in Macedonia, bringing this, the addicts from the street, raising them up and seeing them now leading the churches. Again, the locals reaching the locals in a, such a way that they will connect with them. Um, in Spain, we've seen a, a church, you know, you think, well, it's all bad, but God is moving. And God is moving through these people. In Spain, we have a connection. We, I, I, you remember going to Spain, Angling? I wasn't, I didn't really, did you like it? No, you didn't really like it. I didn't really like it either. And it was, it's tough ground for the gospel. Spain is tough ground. They, they don't want to hear about Jesus. But Spain, this church, was seen as a church growing. Hundreds of people planting churches, doing all themselves, you know. No, of course, with help from outside. So strengthening the, the natives to do 
what they do in a good way. And we see them planting churches over the last two years. I think two or three churches were planted in the, in, in, with a couple of friends in Spain. So we see, we're seeing fantastic things happening uh, through the local missionaries. And the more local, the more native missionaries we can find, the more people on the ground quickly, the more people can reach others because we need. So, uh, oh, yes, it's to, to accelerate the speeding up of the gospel, to, to move it faster. Uh, I, you know, every time I think about, you know, preparing somebody for the mission to, and I'm, we're not talking about being against missionaries going, but the time is short. And so when we find these people, we be back them up to do better. And they're reaching more than we can ever reach by ourselves. How do we do that? First place, when we travel, we be relational. We encourage. It's amazing, you know. When people are discouraged, pastors, leaders, we've seen them all. Uh, we went through the COVID time. We went to these countries. And just sit with them and they're like, we're discouraged. But we're so encouraged that we're not forgotten. We're so encouraged. We will go on. We will move on. Just because you came and you've got, you, you know, with the same mindset. We're praying together. We're loving the Lord together. Uh, we do it through sending teams. I see your church is going to send a team. Fantastic. If you need more uh, places in Europe, we know a few. Bosnia might be one of them. <laughs> I think you have some connection there. But anyway, um, of course we do it. Again, your church has sent financial aid to support this work as well. And that goes straight to the you know, to the areas where we, where it's most needed. Um, again, if, if we talk about Eastern Europe, I don't know if there's Eastern Europeans here. Any Eastern Europeans here? No? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. But we find when you go to Eastern Europe, especially the Balkan region, the young people have moved away because they're looking for better life, more money. So there's a lot of young people missing. So we need to encourage them to, to strengthen the church, to make sure there's financial aid for the pastors to remain doing what they're doing. And of course, we do it by prayer and encouragement continually with our communications. So um, thank you so much for standing with us. Aziza will finish it off now. So I just wanted to finish with um, Isaiah 6, where God asks Isaiah, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who will go for us? We go because it is for the Lord in the first place. It's not even for the people or for ourselves. In the first place, it's because He is asking us to do it and because He loves mankind. And we're still in the time, we still live in the time where grace is abounding. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And of course, like Lisa said, we don't, we're not all sent to go across the seas. We're not all sent to go far away, but we are all sent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just in our families. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's with our friends, with our neighbors, at work. But wherever we go, we are sent. You're not where you are just by accident. Because our God is a God who has a plan. He has a personal plan for our lives, but he also has a plan for the world. Amen. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And the reason is so that everyone may hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is good news, isn't it? It really is. So freely we have received, freely we give. Freely we have received, freely we give. May the Lord bless you. encouraged. Yes. Alright, let's raise our hands. Who's going abroad? <laughs> so I'm just going to share just a few minutes here. Um, let me share first of all. Uh, my name is Randall and my wife Kendra. We're not from here. We don't have an Irish accent, but uh, we believe that God has called us here and, and uh, this is our home. 
And so you people are our family. We've left them uh, originally from Texas. And so uh, when I say you're our family, you're our family. I mean, we cannot jump in a car and drive two hours away to go see our family. You are our family. Mm. Um, last night we had a phone call. It was a difficult phone call. Kendra's uh, stepfather said, look, I need, to, I need to talk to all the kids without the kids. No grandkids. And so we got some bad news. We can't jump in a car. We can't travel to go see to hug them, to care for them. He has cancer and, and uh, it's, it doesn't look good. So. so that's one of the things as we, as we hearken the call to go, there's a cost, there's always a cost. But behind the cost, there's so much that you gain. And so this morning, The organization that we're with, it's, it's called the Assembly of God World Missions. And there's over 3,000 missionaries all over the world. It's a lot of missionaries. But there's a lot of uh, various ministries, but there's one top one, and it's church planting. And so that's for us, that's what God's called call for Kendra and I, is the church plant. And look, Hope Church is three years into this, but... Can I, can I tell you, in my heart already, I'm stirring. I, I'm, I'm ready to, to stretch out. I'm, I'm ready to move on to another little, little village, little town, and, and share. It, you know, that's how the gospel is, is, is grows. We, we had the opportunity a few, uh, I guess it's been a, a month or so ago, we were in a leadership meeting, and uh, it was part of CCI, Christian Churches of Ireland. And Sean Malarkey, who is the superintendent of, of the Christian Churches of Ireland, he shared a story, and uh, I've shared it before, but let me share it again. Because uh, this is my heart, and I think it's Hope Church's heart, and I hope it's yours as well. And the story goes like this, that uh, if you've ever driven around Ireland, you'll, you'll quickly realize that in every town and every village, you will notice something in it. Obviously, it's, you can hear the cathedral. They have that. But there's something almost, can I say, that's even more important than a cathedral. It's their GAA -G clubs. Have you ever gone through a small village and you see their clubs? They're magnificent. They're like temples. I mean, this is, this is, this is it for them. And do you know that all, all over Ireland when you travel, and you see these clubs, it all started because a few men got together and they said every town and every village deserves to have a GAA club. But don't you think that every town and village deserves to have a spirit-filled, believing, loving Jesus yes. church in it? Mm -hmm. that these guys were, they were not... They were, they, they were spirit-filled, but they weren't full of the spirit, if you know what I'm saying. They didn't have the Holy Ghost stirring in them to move them to do this, and look what they did. Look, you're going to get in the car today, and you're going to start driving around, you're going to notice, oh, what Randall said was true. There is a GAA club in every town, in every village. So this, this, the next few minutes, let me share something. Let me give you a little bit of the word. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 6 through 11. And let's, let's read together. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judah and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before them and their and uh, taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. 
They were looking intently up into the sky, and as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Verse 11, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking in the sky? The same Jesus that, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. As, as you can see, this passage comes from the beginning of the book of Acts, chapter 1. And at this point, Jesus has completed his public ministry. He had proclaimed the good news. He had healed the sick. He had died the death that we all desire or deserve. And he had been raised to life in the resurrection. No wonder then the disciples are wondering, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Verse 6. I'm sure you're thinking... I'm sure they were thinking, is it our, our everlasting reign and rule here at last? Did you not hear them? Man, we're going to get to rule and reign. Man, it's our time. The Israelites, it's our time. We're going to rule. We're going to reign. And Jesus answered, shook them. His reign and rule is coming, he assured them, but it is not here yet. So in the meantime, his people, that's you and me, are to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth so that all people so that all people will know the name the forgiveness and the hope of Jesus at Hope Church we want to see a world that knows Jesus that's a good amen right there amen. Amen. we want to see a world that knows that they know Jesus you know our mission statement is bringing hope to all. As we wait for Jesus to return, our task is to be the witness for the gospel to the ends of the earth. My prayer is that we fulfill this task. Worship team, you can come up. So it's been great. We. We've heard of all these ministries that we've given to, you've given to, Hope Church has given to. Now it's, it's a time for you.
Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we've had an opportunity to hear the call on people's lives, Lord, and the impact that you're making on their lives as they've given their lives for you. And so, Lord, we thank you for those that have shared this morning, Lord. We ask that you would multiply their ministries, Lord, that anything that their hearts desire, anything that they need, Lord, that you would fully fund their ministries, Lord, that they would lack nothing, that, Lord, they would have more than enough. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for these ministries. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So stick around. We've got one more song. We're going to have some teas and coffee, and then we're going to go next door and uh, have, have, a, have a meal together. So. Yeah, we, we have some different languages here. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm gonna need you guys. Yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna start. We're gonna start in English. God is so.